Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Mike Goodall, one of the Federation of Small Businesses Development Managers. And thank you for joining us today and welcome to this FSB national webinar on making your business an inclusive workplace. I've got a great lineup of speakers today, each talking to a range of topics. I'll just explain who they are because the presentation is going to run back to back because we've got a lot to get through. And so we'll kick off with Hannah Thomas, who is an employment law specialist with Markle Law. Uh, that's the company that actually sits behind the FSB Legal Services member, Benefit. And Hannah will be talking about legal considerations to be aware of when employing people with disabilities. Following Hannah, we'll have Ellie Wilkinson, uh, newly designated MBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours. Uh, Ellie is the Dyslexic Dysle Dyslexia Consultant, and she'll be joined also by Maeve Monaghan, Chief Executive of Now Group, and they'll be talking about the different types of support available to employers and employees who uh, want to get involved in the workplace, and particularly for employers who want to involve more disabled employees in their business. And then we will be joined by Fiona Campbell, who's the Managing Director of Crazy Capers Limited. And Fiona will be talking about the Disability Confidence Scheme, how you sign up, what the benefits are, and what the current state of play is with that. Following the presentations, we'll have a question and answer session. So you'll see at the bottom of your screen, a Q&A uh, icon. Please use that to type in your questions. And at the end of the presentations, we'll do our very best to cover as many of those as we can within the time available. We will, of course, do our best to answer all of those, but if we can't get round to answering them, we will pick them up after the meeting. Just to let you know as well that this session is being recorded. So if you can't stay for the whole uh, duration, don't worry. Uh, if you want to catch up later, don't worry. And if you want to share the content with any of your colleagues or associates, again, don't worry. You'll be able to get it after the event from our on-demand service on our website, fsb.org.uk. Now, I'll shortly be handing over to Hannah, our first speaker, but before I do, I'd just like to take a couple of minutes, if I may, to explain the background to this session. So Federation of Small Businesses, FSB, is actually the largest business organisation by membership, by some considerable margin. And in addition to providing our members with a range of essential business services at low or no cost, an important part, a very important part of our work is to engage our members and indeed the wider small business community in research and policy development work so that we have an evidence-based approach that we can take to local, regional and national government to campaign and develop policies that work for small businesses, the people who run them and the people who are employed in them. Now we use the findings of that research all the time to influence and lobby across the piece. And in April, and a really important piece of research uh, was around improving the prospects for people with disabilities who are entrepreneurs, small business owners, and employees within small businesses. The re research re culminated in a report called Business Without Barriers, hence the title at the top of my, uh, my screen here. And that report set out some of the key facts, challenges, and opportunities facing disabled people in the workplace. Now it's a very long report with a very comprehensive suite of uh, findings and recommendations, but just to give you a flavor uh, of some of the findings that are relevant to today's event. Uh, so firstly, it showed that a quarter of small business owners at the moment uh, report having a disability or a health condition. A little over half, 51%, have employed somebody with a disability or health condition in the last three years. And a slightly higher proportion, 52%, have expressed a barrier, or have experienced a barrier, should I say, due to their difficulty or their health condition. On the basis of this research and other research we've conducted previously, we know at FSB that small businesses punch way above their weight compared to larger corporate enterprises when it comes to providing opportunities for people with disabilities. And at FSB, we want to see this strong foundation to be built upon. That's why the report contains a series of practical and quite um, stretching recommendations for policymakers and government. The key thing that we're calling for 
is a target of 100,000 new disabled entrepreneurs by 2025. So today's event is very much about overcoming barriers so that as many disabled people as possible can fulfill their true potential as entrepreneurs, business owners, and employees. So you'll be glad to know that's it from me for now. I'll be back for the Q&A session. So please, please do use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Keep those questions flowing in. We'll cover them at the end. And uh, that's it from me for now. I shall now hand over to Hannah Thomas, Employment Specialist from Martha Law for the first of our four presentations. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike, uh, for the introduction. It's a real pleasure to be speaking to you all this morning uh, around employing disabled workers. Um, I know this is uh, an issue uh, in terms of around achieve, achieving inclusivity for FSB members that we speak to. So um, I think this is really topical and really helpful discuss discussion this morning. Um, so I'm going to just, I know that Mike has very helpfully set up the background in terms of who is affected by disability um, and, and the statistics that Mike has cited very much reflect the government statistics for last year. And these show that 20% of the working age population are classes disabled uh, and that more people are reporting a long term health condition or disability than did so eight years ago. And interestingly, the increasing number of people reporting a disability is largely being driven by an increase in mental health conditions. I'm going to talk uh, around the legal obligations um, when employing staff with disability. And this is framed in the Equality Act 2010. And this act in particular places obligations on both businesses who provide goods and services, as well as employers, not to discriminate on the basis of a disability and to make what are called reasonable adjustments. This is essentially about overcoming barriers. And these legal obligations apply regardless of the businesses or the employer's size. They do, of course, apply to small business employers. Now, who is disabled uh, under statute according to this piece of legislation, the Equality Act? A disabled person is legally defined as someone with a physical or mental impairment that has a substantial and long-term adverse effect on their ability to carry out their normal day-to-day -day activities. So their normal day-to-day -day activities will of course include attending the workplace. And now long-term means the impairment has lasted or is likely to last or has lasted at least 12 months. Uh, are we seeing this defini definition has been noted, for example, in relation to long COVID where that um, lasts or is likely to last at least 12 months. Now, where an employee is disabled and the employer knows this, perhaps because the employee has disclosed this fact, or, and the employer can't choose to turn a blind eye to this, where the employer ought reasonably to have known that an employee has a disability, it's going to be unlawful to discriminate either directly, either directly because that person has a disability, or more indirectly. Now, indirect discrimination may occur where the employer has a requirement or a practice, perhaps a policy, and it applies to everyone in the workplace, but it puts the disabled employee at a substantial disadvantage compared to non-disabled employees. Um, and if this is the case, then the employer will need to justify that particular requirement. I'm going to talk a bit about reasonable adjustments, because as Mike says, this morning's session is very much about overcoming barriers. And the key to this is, uh, as well as it being a legal requirement, it's going to be the employer implementing reasonable adjustments in the workplace to remove or reduce any substantial disadvantage suffered by that employee when compared to non-disabled staff. Now, quite often on the, on the FSB legal advice line, we're asked by small business employers, well, how, how do I know um, whether a step is reasonable uh, to take? Um, obviously, we have limited resources, um, but the law requires us to apply reasonable adjustments. So when is an adjustment reasonable? Fortunately, we, we can answer this in terms that we have guidance. And this sets out that a step will be reasonable to take or an adjustment if it would be effective in preventing the particular disadvantage faced by the disabled employee, if the step is practical to take, and if, the, if it is financially viable, 
um, and the extent of any disruption caused by taking that step. For example, disruption caused to other staff who may be taking on additional work as a result of adjusting the disabled employee's workload, the extent of the employer's financial and other resources, bearing in mind, and this is obviously key for a small business employer, the size and the type of employer, and the availability of financial and other assistance to help make the required adjustments. Uh, so examples of reasonable adjustments, and I would say, and I would really emphasise that rather than assume as an employer, you really should, must rather, have the conversation with your employee in terms of, by asking them what adjustments are required, um, not to start with whether the adjustments are reasonable, but just to simply have that conversation, what adjustments um, may you require that may assist in the workplace and it is often very helpful to ask for the employee's consent uh, to approach their GP for a medical report in terms of the effect of their disability um, or perhaps if you have access to occupational health advice get an occupational health report. So some examples of reasonable adjustments and these are of course just examples that may assist would be altering a person's working hours. Um, quite often a disabled employee may request this as part of a flexible working application, but not necessarily so, but I just highlight that just for something to be aware of, because if someone does uh, request an adjustment and it's a reasonable adjustment, then it would be unlawful to refuse that adjustment. It could include altering the person's role or perhaps aspects of their role. It could include allowing additional breaks throughout the working day. Um, I think this is particularly helpful for neurodiverse employees, um, could be permitting the employee to work in a quieter or less overwhelming workspace or part of the workspace. Um, and if the employee requests this or is going to be helpful for the employee, perhaps even um, agreeing that they could be excluded from group activities, for example, but obviously uh, don't make assumptions and this has to be done with the employee's agreement. It could be allowing absences during the working days for the purposes of them receiving medical treatment or consultation giving additional training to that individual. Also, uh, perhaps mentoring support could be really helpful. So having someone as a point of contact that could act perhaps as a mentor and getting special equipment or modifying existing equipment. It could be some simple steps that are required in terms of modification. Um, for job applicants, um, a suggested reasonable adjustment could be allowing a disabled job applicant extra time to complete a recruitment test or other assessment or allowing them to complete it in a different format and we have had case law around this where a employer has been quite rigid in the recruitment process and then they have failed to provide a, a reasonable adjustment during their uh, recruitment procedure and I would also say it's really helpful to state on the application form um, for there to be a, a box perhaps for the applicant to tick if they do just to say whether they do require adjustments to the recruitment process or perhaps the interview and so forth. Managing sick leave and pay, pay, this is something we deal with a lot on the FSB legal advice line and um, essentially employers must pay statutory sick pay at least to workers who meet the eligibility um, conditions for this. It's paid at a flat rate. Now, if the employer does have a written sickness absence, ill health capability procedure or performance capability procedure, then of course the employer must follow that policy. But I underline this because it's really important uh, in terms of implementing reasonable adjustments to a particular policy or procedure that you have. Uh, as an example, under a policy, the employer may have trigger points for action or for review with the employee. For example, after one month sickness absence or where there is frequent short term absences or perhaps where the employee is not performing in their role, then that may be a trigger point for um, the employee to investigate the situation with the employee to better understand what, what is the cause of that. And perhaps with the employee's permission to request a medical report from their GP or an occupational health advisor to better understand the support they need to get them back into work or perhaps to assist them with their, with their performance uh, or with their role. Uh, we have disability discrimination. I'm just going to um, give an overview around this. It's always going to be unlawful to treat an employee less favourably because of their disability. Uh, this is what is known as direct discrimination and it can never be justified in law. Uh, alternatively, an employee will discriminate 
discriminate against a disabled employee if it treats them unfavorably, not directly because of the fact of their disability, but because of something arising as a consequence of their disability and where this can't be justified by the employer. So I've got here in the image um, a scale, scales of justice. So it's very much around the disadvantage to the in employee of a particular policy or requirement. And that's weighed against the extent to which it's proportionate and the employer can justify that policy or requirement. So examples of what could be something that is a conse arising consequence of a disability could be the employee's poor work performance, completing tasks too slowly, perhaps making um, a greater than average number of mistakes, or a poor attendance record, perhaps needing a greater, um, higher than average number of uh, days off work uh, uh, sick leave, or requiring regular breaks. Now, I've just um, cited this case law because it's a really good illustration. It doesn't create new law in any way, but it's a really good illustration of uh, where an employer can get this wrong in terms of their own particular requirements and policies. Uh, so this uh, it was the Leicester Employment Tribunal. They heard this case. It was a senior nurse. And she was dismissed because of her unacceptable sickness absence record. The employer had a particular policy in place that with, with, ab, with uh, targets for absence, and she'd exceeded that, I think, by eight times. Um, and she suffered from migraines, anxiety, and depression. Uh, these were recognised to be disabilities for her in her particular case. Uh, and the tribunal found that she was unfairly dismissed and she was discriminate, discriminated against uh, due to something arising from her disability, namely a high level of absence. And the tribunal and where the employer went wrong is the tribunal found that um, this wasn't justified, although it can be fair to dismiss someone for this reason. Uh, in this particular case, uh, she'd received a medical report which gave an optimistic prognosis for her future ability to attain work regularly. And she'd also just completed a successful phase return to work. Uh, she also claimed because of the uh, COVID policies that the NHS Trust had in place at their time. Uh, she wasn't able to carry around with her water bottle to keep um, hydrated and the dehydration that she suffered was a trigger unfortunately for, for those migraines that she suffered. The tribunal judge um, made the point very succinctly um, uh, by stating that the reasonable adjustment, the purpose of the reasonable adjustment is to ensure a level playing field uh, and that this couldn't be achieved by the employer if all the absences allowed are taken up with disability related matters, because they did include um, the time she took off for her uh, as a result of her disability, um, and it left no room for other legitimate absence. So just, uh, just a quick word about um, FSB legal um, for those who are listening who are already FSB members, just to ensure you make good use of the services that, we, that are on offer to you, we do have a telephone line, uh, telephone advice line, which is staffed by solicitors uh, for any particular queries that may arise. And we also have the FSB Legal Hub, where we do have fact sheet guidance on unlawful discrimination, disability, and a large number of template letters for managing the sickness absence. Uh, workplace discrimination issues and health and safety guidance. Um, so I just want to say um, thank you for listening. Um, and I'm just going to hand over now to Ellie Wilkinson who, from the Dyslexic uh, Dyslexia Consultant. Thank you, May. Right. Hello. So Ellie Wilkinson, or Elizabeth Wilkinson, but everybody calls me Ellie. I am the dyslexic, dyslexia consultant. Um, I am dyslexic and I am autistic and I have visual stress. So I need blue lenses, which really helps me access text. That's separate to dyslexia. One of my biggest bugbears is people and thinking that coloured lenses and paper helps dyslexics. It doesn't. It helps those of us who have visual stress. So my lecture done, I will move on. I am the founder of Dyslexia Awards and Dyslexia Information Day, both of which are not-for-profit events and they are about empowering and inspiring my fellow dyslexics and other people. The Dyslexia Awards are um, founded in 2015 and they are about shining a positive spotlight on dyslexics, dyslexia, and turning the negative publicity on its head. Um, I get very cross with headlines that say um, local dyslexic has overcome dyslexia or things like that. We don't overcome these things. We have skills and talents 
and there are so many amazing dyslexics out there. As you can see, I'm very passionate. Um, FSB sponsored the Entrepreneur Award, so massive thanks to them, and it's wonderful to shine a light on amazing people. We also have awards for supportive employers and supportive educators, so employers, if you're listening to everything that Hannah's just said about reasonable adjustments and you follow those, you could win an award, um, not just us that does them. Anyway, that's enough of that. So things out there that can help. There's a pot of funding called Access to Work. And it's a very strange name, Access to Work, because it doesn't actually get you access to work. It helps keep you in work. So it's for anybody who is classed as disabled. And dyslexia, of course, comes under that, that disability um, label because it's lifelong in its effects. If you have developmental dyslexia, then it's lifelong in its effects. If you have acquired dyslexia, then um, it's going to be lifelong in its effects from when you acquired the dyslexia. That's a whole other session. So access to work is a pot of funding that will help employers make reasonable adjustments for their employees. It covers anybody with a disability. So that could be hidden disabilities like dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, ADHD, ADD, all sorts of things, big long list of people and conditions. So the link is on, on the screen there for you if you want to access that. Bear with me one second, please. My fan has just turned off and I'm getting very, very warm, panicking a little bit. Okay, <laughs> so access to work funding. What difference can it make? Well, you have to, your employee can apply for access to work funding, but you have to be on board with them going for this funding because you're going to be paying the invoices and then claiming back the costs as an employer. Depending on the size of your organisation depends how much funding you get. So if you are self-employed, for example, all your funding will be completely um, fully funded, everything, the equipment, the support, etc. If you have 50 or less employees, again, it will be fully funded. If you have more than 50, and then there's stages as it goes up, depending on the size of the organisation, depends how much funding you get. But as this is something that under law you have to do anyway, go for access to work funding, because even if you just get a thousand pounds towards the costs, it's a thousand pound less that you have to spend. But with all of these things, the one to one coaching and support that you get or that your employees get is free, no matter the size of the organisation. You can also get funding towards staff training. It may not be a great deal of money towards the staff training. Um, they may give you £50 or £75. And if you want to train all of your staff, you may have a trainer that actually charges you 1,500 for the day. But again, every little helps and every little bit helps with the organisation and your employees because for every person that gets support, they start to learn about themselves, their disability, how it impacts and how they can work better at work and how their, their employer can support them better at work. That then impacts on family life because things like specific learning difficulties, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, tend to run in families, there's a familial link. So if an adult, a parent is dealing with learning how these things affect them and how to work well at work and how to implement strategies, this impacts on family life. This then has a beautiful knock-on effect to children, other family members, and that then has a wider effect on the community. And then that reflects beautifully on your business because you've offered that support in the first place. I feel like I'm giving a bit of an elevator pitch now, but access to work support and supporting your dyslexic employees is definitely the right thing to do. In fact, supporting all your employees, obviously, but I can only speak from the dyslexia specific learning difficulties side of things. So how do you apply? You go online, you fill in a form and you go through steps of telling them who you are, what your disability is. And one of the questions is, what do you know what you need? If so, tell us here. Most people don't know what they need because they haven't been through the process of understanding how their disability, particularly hidden disabilities, affect them. 
So sometimes it's a good idea to go through the needs assessment process. That could be with a access to work needs assessor, or you can get um, private needs assessors if you don't want to go through that process, such as um, succeeding with dyslexia. Um, Mandy Parton, she does really great access to work reports and um, not access to work reports, sorry, needs assessment reports and great dyslexia assessments. Um, from there, you then start to get to understand what equipment you need, what reasonable adjustments can be put in place. And that's when the magic happens. You get to see people suddenly using software, implementing strategies that just take the stress away. None of them are a magic fix. None of them make everything go away. You're not suddenly not dyslexic or not autistic. But anybody who is dyslexic or autistic, dyscalculic, dyspraxic, you will know when I say to you, those days that you wake up, but before you even open your eyes, you know it's going to be a bad day. Well, this software and this equipment makes those days copable. So you get to the end of the day and you're not absolutely worn out, which means when you go home to your family or you spend your time with your family, you're not exhausted, which then means when you go into work the next day, you can function and you work and you're not going to be off with stress. Which leads me to beautifully the fact that for if there was some research done by the government that for every one pound spent out on access to work funding, they recouped four pounds because people are not going off sick. They're not claiming disability benefits or PIP or whatever the other things are. And they are being productive in work. So for employers, it also means you're not paying out sick pay, high staff turnover, etc. And one of the things I asked some of my clients was about what difference does it make? And it was lovely to hear Hannah say it levels the playing field. And it really does. For employees, they actually feel like they're achieving to their potential. They're not having to focus on the things they don't do well. Their skills and talents are being utilised within a workplace, which, of course, makes their employees happy. And we all know happy employees lead to productive employees. Productive employees leads to good, good company practice. And of course, good company practice, practice and employees who are happy and work well are good for business. And that really, really positively impacts wider than just your business. It goes out to the community. So access to work funding is not a handout. It helps with mental health. It helps with productivity. And to be honest, I don't know why every company isn't going for it. One thing to remember is when you have a new starter, if you need to go for access to work and you apply within six weeks, I'm told that no matter the size of your company, all it's fully funded if you have a new starter. Also, another point is it takes about 12 weeks for your application to be processed. So if you're not sure, apply straight away, apply as soon as possible. So I hope that helps you to understand a little bit the, the impact it has. Three tips from one of my um, largest clients says, listen to your employees, use access to work to get funding, and remember that not all adjustments cost lots of money. The smallest changes can have the biggest effects. So I think I'm within time. I forgot to set my timer, I do apologize. I'm going to hand over to Maeve Monahan, who's Chief Executive Officer of the NAB Group. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I think you did really well um, recovering from your fan not working. So, and it was fantastic hearing um, about the work you do. Yes, I, I'm delighted to be here today um, and hearing from these amazing speakers that are, are telling the story about the positive impact that disabled people can have on, on our workplaces. And I think, you know, historically, lots of the conversations have been around, you know, keeping employers safe, you know, how you work in the, the legal piece, which is really, really important as well. But I think um, the conversation has changed um, recently and it's so exciting to be in a space now where employers are looking, genuinely looking at a pool of talent of disabled people and seeing how they can best fit into their organisation and perform well. Uh, I'm the Chief Executive of Now Group. 
Um, you probably recognize the accent um, from, from Northern Ireland. And we support about 1,800 people with learning difficulties and autism who are on the search for uh, employment and, uh, and support those individuals into jobs with the future. Uh, um, over a length of time. And I suppose a range of disability can be from people with reading and writing issues and some of the conditions that were mentioned um, by previous speakers, right through to people with very significant multiple disabilities and everybody in between. And the model works because we're matching individuals with the right work and the right type of job. And we're providing support for that individual in the workplace and for the employer. And I think that's one of the things, you know, people ask me why um, Now Group have been so successful placing disabled people into work. And I think, you know, that the, the um, the world has changed. Employers are now looking for talent. They're looking in different places for talent. So the timing's perfect. But also, I'm very clear that the support that is required is for the individual, the disabled individual, but also for the employer. And I've been in this, um, this game long enough to know that those conversations have changed. You know, I, I, in general, the support that we're talking about for a disabled person is no different than the support that you would be expected to do as a good employer. But I think what tends to happen when I'm speaking to employers is they're particularly concerned about doing it wrong, making a mistake, uh, getting into trouble, and, you know, you know, having a legal implication but more importantly just not doing it right so they don't do anything at all and I think that's the worst situation to be in I would encourage businesses to be looking now at diversity in your workplace and I don't think business can afford not to do this to be completely honest I think the world has moved on we need to be as innovative and as um, diverse as possible and people with disabilities have a significant part to play in the most successful businesses right across all areas. And, and, and that's right from very small owner-led businesses right up to big um, multinationals. And I think in the number, you know, in, the, in recent years, I've seen that breadth of experience. So we would be supporting people, um, you know, with Asperger's, for instance, who would be university lecturers, GPs, who admit high, high paid jobs, right through to people who, you know, a real success would be getting a, a two to three hour job a week in an entry level position and everybody in between. So anybody who's on the call that's an employer, we're talking about you. But also we need to be realistic that um, disability is the only one of the um, areas of, um, you know, the areas of support required are, are discriminated against groups that we're all going to end up being in at some stage in our life as we age, as we acquire disabilities. And I think when you look at it through that lens, it just makes good business sense. Um, and a really good employer who makes an accessible workplace for their employees is also sending a message out to your customers. And I think that's one of the things that businesses have been talking to us quite recently. They're starting to understand the spending power of disabled people in their families and the value that they have as customers. And that changes that relationship from being something that would be nice to do because you want to do it for a woman employee to realize that you can't afford as a business not to do it. And you know, you've heard from the previous um, speakers or access to workers are a really good scheme. We use it ourselves as an organization who employ um, one in seven of all of our staff have a disability. But also, you know, em employment support schemes as well, like Now Group, for instance, in Northern Ireland, we would provide ongoing support. So the retention rate of our participants that we that, you know, last year we supported 100 people into paid jobs. This year it will be 200. And of those people who were who secured employment, the retention rate after 12 months was 83 percent. So we need to start busting some of the myths about disabled people being unreliable or costing more or, you know, being a drain on business. In many, many cases, disabled people are much better workers, much more reliable and end up adding to a business. And I think when you look at it through that lens, the, the thing that organizations like Now Group want to do is just make it as easy as possible for businesses to make sure that, um, to, to talk to walk them through it so that it isn't so um, scary that they just choose not to do it um, in Northern Ireland I suppose with the 
like most places in the UK, the level of um, unemployment is so low at the minute that we are starting to look at this significant population of people of, who are economically inactive and working at ways to support them and to work on disabled people um, across the UK, but more significantly in Northern Ireland, make up at least half of the, you know, the, the population of um, people who are in economically inactive. So as businesses start to search for different talent pools, they are a perfect population to be supporting and making your businesses adaptable so that you can look at bringing the, the, this fantastically talented, capable group of people <laughs> into your workforce and making it more innovative and diverse. And we would support individuals in our group in a whole range of different industries with catering, retail, hospitality, digital, warehousing. And then, um, uh, you know, it just depends. We have, we have one person who just got a job this week as a, a scuba diving instructor. So we're, we're trying to open up the art for the possible here. Um, disabled people are part of every part of society and that businesses need to be reflective of your customer base and the community in which you're working. And we as organizations need to make that as easy as possible for you. So I think access and or access to work is a really good scheme, but talking to your local disability employment organizations is another way. And then really looking at where you're finding it difficult to recruit people. So we'll provide an academy type model, you know, where we'll train 25 to 50 people at a time and we'll look at placing them in, in employment. And it's gone from businesses where they maybe would have I would have been really nudging them to give us one job to the fact that business, some business now are taking four or five people at a time. And I think that changes the whole perception of, you know, the inclusion of disabled people across the workforce. I'll, I'll, I'll find, I'll, I'll finish on a, a little piece about our jam card initiative. So it's www.jamcard.org and it's jam which is, stands for just a minute. And it's a card that's been designed by people with um, hidden disabilities. So they get just that minute of patience when they're accessing goods and services, or customer service and buses and shops at hotels. And it, the reason why I give you an example of that is that became a card that our, our participants in Belfast had designed just for themselves so they could access the city. We now have 110,000 jam card users across the UK with about three and a half thousand businesses who are signed up to become jam card friendly. They pay to become jam card friendly businesses. They get trained up on how to support excellent customer services for people with hidden disabilities. And what we find in that is the, the, the power has shifted. Disabled people and their families have significant spending power. They're amazing customers. They are choosing where to spend their money based on how businesses look and how they feel and whether they feel that they're welcome and I think jam cards are a really really good initiative that shows that businesses are starting to realize that but at the bottom line really good customer service for people with disabilities is really good customer service for all customers and I think that's where the, the, the excitement comes I'm really delighted to, to read the research and see the interest on the call today but I think you know, as an employer, don't sit back panicking or worrying, you know, and be afraid to start, start talking to people about how you might do that. And, and if, even if you're, you're not really looking at the minute to employ somebody with a disability, you will find that you will have people with disabilities in your workforce and they need to be supported as well. Uh, and if they don't have that at the minute, there's acquired disabilities. So that idea that it's a them and us is a myth it's all of us <laughs> and the better we get this now and the, the more positive this conversation is I think the better and more um, the better it is for our businesses overall as well it just makes good business sense so thank you very much and I'll hand over to the next speaker Hi <clears throat> I'm Fiona Campbell and I'm the managing director of Crazy Capers Out of School Care we're a very small business that has been in existence now for 15 years and as such, we have employed a lot of individuals who have hidden disabilities within the workplace. Um, through that, we have become a dis disability confident um, 
employer and, and working alongside the different schemes with regards to this um, I fell into the disability um, commit, committed status to start off with through talking to my job centre plus advisor I was then passed on to a disability advisor who basically was trying to enable me to get back into the workplace we found that there was many barriers and different things I have hidden disabilities that are not maybe obvious to everybody and we found it was quite difficult to, when an employer realised that I had a disability that to enable me to go back into the workplace, they were saying, oh no, we can't deal with that, we can't deal with that. So through the Disability Confidence Scheme and through the Job Centre for Disability Advisors, I was enabled um, to get back into employment. Um, I maybe did it in a roundabout way in that I started my own business working in childcare because I couldn't find childcare for my own son at the time. Um, the Disability Confidence Schemes of IDEA has three different levels. The basic level, I believe, just about every employer sh should already be meeting. And they should, for, I would encourage them to sort of look into this schemes of IDEA and try and sign up to it. Um, basically, if you are being able to provide maybe work experience to someone or paid employment, work trials, um, job sharing, job shadowing, trainees, um, basic bits and pieces, internships, studentships, you're already meeting some of the some of the requirements for being a disability committed employer. Um, so looking at different ways and how the employees within your workplace can, can benefit, if you enable them to feel comfortable within the workplace and carry out their duties through being part of a disability confident employer, you will be you will see that reap the benefits, etc, from enabling them to be part of your workforce. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm loaded with the cold today, I apologise. So maybe just going back a wee bit and just explaining what exactly what I'm looking for. Disability comes in many different forms, but should not be shown as a barrier to employment under any means. You will probably find that many of your current employees do have some form of hidden disability, whether that be an acquired disability over the last few months or whether that be a long term disability. Many people do not want to mention their disability within the workplace for fear of other barriers that are there. And as part of a disability confident employer, you would be actually enabling them to speak freely about whatever hidden disabilities they have and be able to enable them to sort of move forward and develop their career skills and their skills that will benefit you as the employer within the workplace. Um, there, as I said before, there are three levels and to complete each level within the disability commitment scheme, you will find that there are already things that you're probably doing. For the first um, level, you, your business, as I say, is probably already doing this. You are looking just to ensure that there's your applications for employment in the first place are open to all. So if I do, there is no barriers to um, coming to an, an interview for your position. Hannah mentioned this sort of idea of making sure that there is a box within your application form saying that if there's any adjustments that need to be made within the interview process or the recruitment process, just to sort of um, have the individuals sign up to that at that point sort of idea to give you some awareness on what adjustments you can make there. From there, Hannah also mentioned access to work, as did Ellie and Maeve. Um, access to work can enable an individual within the workplace to perform to the same extent as everybody else, or even to some occasions to a higher extent, because they may be more, they may have specific skills that they've developed in order to to overcome their disability. So it's always quite good to sort of look at different ways you can enable a member to move forward. Within our workplace, we've made reasonable adjustments on many different things of idea. We have looked at hours of work. We have looked at, um, maybe Ellie would be, be, appreciate where I'm coming from here, looking at different programs within the computer that can enable with word to mouth communications of idea, um, dyslexia recognition and different things like that. So it's looking at different ways that you can make, adapt your workplace in order to meet um, the needs of the individual. Um, the disability confident um, scheme itself is an easy to manage scheme sort of idea. There is not a lot of emphasis on what the employer must do and there's no additional work as such. 
it's things that you're already doing for your employees of idea and making sure that um, you have these things in place to enable them the employees then feel welcomed within the workplace and they show commitment and loyalty to your um, the place of work Personally, I found the assistance through our local job centre. I was given a named disability confident um, manager to help with me, so I did, and they talked me through the process. Basically, it was a self-assessment process, looking at what systems we have in the workplace. Also, as Hannah Thomas had mentioned earlier, so if I did, what policies and procedures we have that could be, if they weren't adapted appropriately, could be seen as discriminatory against someone with a disability. So it was making sure that we had all those bits and pieces in place, so if I did, and that we were willing to accept trainees, volunteers, students, etc., within the workplace to give them an offer and try and see if they could come in and join and contribute to the workplace. As a disability employer, again, it's a self-assessment process of idea, looking at um, enhancing what you're already doing. So basically, you're looking at how you can enable, excuse me, <coughs> individuals within your workplace to develop their skills further and to maintain their current job roles. So again, it's looking at the self-assessment process and developing that further and just making sure that all of your team are involved. Just because someone has a disability doesn't mean to say that they're any different from everybody else. It's a fully inclusive programme of idea, which every individual within the workplace has the same contribution. Yes, there might be some reasonable adjustments to make, but at the same time, we're looking to ensure that everybody else is involved heavily within the process of idea. And the named individual who has the disability is not necessarily known to everyone. We're saying, well, okay, we're just going to change. We're looking at better ways of doing things to make sure that the, play, the whole environment is inclusive. You do not have to say, oh, it's John Smith sort of over there that needs a bit of assistance with this. So it's looking at ways to, where we can all work together to make the entire workplace to be a happy and comfortable place to work within. I'm trying to think what else is next to say. Um, disability Confident Leader is the third tier of the Disability Confidence Scheme. As yet, I have not um, applied for this myself. So if I do, as I say, we're a very small business. We've got less than 10 employees. But that's something we're looking to do in the future. Again, it's a self-validated um, assessment with an independent, however, in this case, an independent um, assessment would also come out to ensure that you're following all the different criteria of what you're doing to support disabled people within the workplace. And just to confirm that you're employing disabled people within the workplace, with all three levels of the scheme, you receive a certificate saying that you have reached that level of commitment and that you can use a badge on your um, current documents, i.e. your um, employment contract, your application documents, your website, your social media. As um, Maeve had just mentioned before, this attracts more people to come and use your services, be interested in your workforce, etc., and look at different ways to move forward. Um, there are many links to uh, on, it's a very, as I say, it's a very easy process. There are many links to sort of finding out how to become more appropriate. So if you Google disability confident, you will find out all the government links, your local job centre links, etc. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. As I've just said, local um, job centre links are very, very beneficial to lo local employers. Sort of idea, they will enable you to find out where you will find out different organizations that are working within your group that maybe support people with disabilities. They will enable you to find out different training programs. They will be able to find out for you different um, uses of access to work granting and things like that, what is suitable for your industry and how to help you out. So make use of what you've got around you. Um, as I say, I work in childcare, but I also wear another hat in that my volunteer for the Fibromyalgia Association, so Fibromyalgia Action UK, Fibromyalgia Action UK is a charity, it's a national charity based throughout the UK that's looking at different ways to enable people, support people with fibromyalgia. As part of this, we also provide uh, employers handbooks of idea to look at enabling employers to include people with this condition within the workplace. It gives lots of details of different Reasonable adjustments, again, this common phrase that could be made to ensure that someone with this condition can be 
included within your workplace of idea. So anybody looking for more information, please do not hesitate to contact me and I'll put a link up later on on how you can sort of find out more about fibromyalgia in the workplace and what support FMA UK can give within the workplace. Um, I'm not sure what else I can probably tell you about the bits and pieces that are going on so if I do, but I would like to thank Hannah, Maeve and Ellie for all their information. I will probably be contacting you all for some more information myself. I would like to pass back to Mike Goodall now from, Fibroma, from um, FSB, please. Thank you, Fiona, and thank you to all our speakers for some really insightful uh, presentations there and some really useful information that hopefully uh, people who are on the, the session today will be able to uh, make use of straight away or go away and just give them some more food for thought. Um, we've had a few questions in, so I'm going to open up the session to the panel now um, just to address uh, four or five questions that we have. Um, the first of which is um, we're hearing a lot around employers struggling to recruit staff at the moment at all sorts of levels. And yet we know both from our own Business Without Barriers report and from national statistics that disability employment rates lag significantly behind the general employment rate. So the question is, how do we do better to match that demand, which is clearly out there, with the supply, which also appears to be out there? Who would like to take the lead on that one? Maeve, would you like to kick off? This is my favourite subject. <laughs> I, I, I think it's nearly like a dating game in a way, and I don't mean to be facetious about that. It's, it's, it's about introducing the two groups to each other and allowing a safe space for the conversations to be had so people can understand and feel safe about taking it forward. So when I, when I say that, I mean businesses need people they're one of the biggest you know i was speaking to some hospitality businesses in northern ireland yesterday and and two key stresses for them at the minute other than um cost of utilities <laughs> one being paying back covid loans and two finding people to keep their businesses open so they're constantly looking but they don't know that there is a group of amazingly talented people that are that are there looking for work and disabled people are looking for work and they don't know that businesses are looking for them. And I think that's a piece of matching that up together. And I um, you know, I have seen that change so significantly over the years. And I said, I said earlier in my presentation, initially I would have been going with one person in mind to an employer and said, I'll go on, just give them a chance, just try it out, one chance, try it out for a couple of months, see how it goes. That conversation has completely flipped now businesses are coming to us and they're saying, how many people have you? So what we need to work on is we need to be very clear about the talents and the skills that disabled people have. And employers need to be very clear about the jobs that they have available. And then we need to have the support in place so that the barriers aren't the problem. So all of the systems that need to be in place with any uh, reasonable adjustments and adapt, adapt, adaptations, that has to be easy for the business around that. And for the, and the employee, they need to get a chance. Sometimes they fall at the first hurdle that the interview is too difficult and it doesn't need to be, or that the entry requirements require people to have an academic qualification that they don't actually need for the job. So I think it's those, it, it's that kind of matching up piece. You need to give these people a chance and they will bust every myth you have about people with disabilities. You know. Somebody had said to me recently, you know, if you meet one person with a disability, you've met one person with a disability. You cannot categorize all of these people, all of us together in one, in, in one population. This is an a group of individually talented people who may require some support to excel in your workplace. And the uh, you know, really innovative employers see that as an opportunity. And just like they would do when they're trying to resource uh, a young from the young talent pool they would adapt their recruitment processes accordingly and there is nobody more entrepreneurial than business people so they just need to get their thinking hat how to do it and we have to also make sure and I said to the disability organizations that I partner with we can't hammer employers every time they make 
a mistake or they say something wrong, although people have rights and you have to treat people right equally, but people need to be able to voice their concerns and get the support they need to do it right. So that's my feeling. Um, bit of a dating agency, but lo lots more opportunity than threats, I think. That's great. Thanks, Maeve. I'm just conscious of time. I'll, I'll move on to the next question, if I may, uh, which is around... Uh, there's been a lot uh, in the press about flexible working uh, through the COVID pandemic, uh, good and bad. Um, do you have a view on flexible working for disabled staff? And has that become better or worse, given that so many others have uh, sort of moved to this model? Uh, I think, Ellie, this is a, um, perhaps one of your key uh, platforms that you like to speak to. Well, I'm personally, I work from home um, and having to use zoom to do my sessions which is what people have been telling me for years <laughs> finally being forced to do it being autistic i thought that actually it would be awful because i can't see people i can't get but actually you can still i can still see when somebody's fiddling with something under the table even though i can only see this much of them um, so for me it's been brilliant because i also have the peace and quiet at home to be able to step out into you no know, big offices with lots of people in. however for other people they've not liked it at all because they like that social interaction, there isn't the autism there, so they, they miss that interaction. But generally for mental health and, and, and well-being, for those people that have been sensible and scheduled in breaks, it's been really good. But there is that, the issue has been for some of the organisations I work with, with people doing back-to-back -back constantly with no breaks in between. So, so as, as soon as that's addressed, I think it's been quite positive for so many people and um, a few people I know with physical disabilities who have all their adaptations at home that mean they can do whatever they want to do they don't have to worry about having to go into a workplace where there's no access to anything so yeah I think it's been a good thing but one size doesn't fit all. Perfect. Thanks, Ellie. Um, I'm going to choose one final question now because we've only really got three minutes left until the end of this session. Uh, probably one for Fiona because it's specifically around uh, the Disability Confidence Scheme. Um, our Business Without Barriers report indicates that um, a small business owners, are around just less than a quarter, 23% have heard of the scheme. Of those, around a third understand it, and a slightly sl uh, smaller proportion think it's important. So, from your perspective, uh, how much uptake do you think there's been of the scheme, and what more could or should be done to increase awareness and uptake uh, going forward? You're on mute, Fiona. I'm mute myself. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I must admit, before. Um having a period of unemployment myself due to ill health, I was completely unaware of the Disability Confidence Scheme. And it was only through the excellent staff at my local job centre and the disability support worker that I found out about it myself. Um, as I say, through them and through other working agencies, I've now started my own business and I can now see the benefits of that. I think more awareness of the Disability Confidence Scheme is definitely needed with it across the sectors both from the employers side of view, because we're missing out on a huge pool of talented individuals that are not recognised at all and not maybe coming forward for jobs because they're scared of the label that they have. So I think under these circumstances, we need to make much more awareness of the Disability Confidence Scheme. Um, I would recommend every employer to look at ways of uptaking sort of recognition under this and becoming um, sort of a disability confident employer themselves. So if I do, and I think that will make a big, big difference to the shortages of jobs, that, to the shortages of applicants we have currently for jobs. At the moment, so I'm advertising for jobs myself. So if I did, and I'm not getting any applicants, I know there are people out there that could fit these roles. So if I do, but just because they've got a hidden label, so if I do, that they think prevents them back into the workplace. I think that they're missing out on opportunities there as well. So definitely I would increase, uh, encourage as many employers as possible to look into the disability confidence scheme and look at the support that the scheme itself can provide yourselves as employers. Brilliant. Thank you, um, Fiona. I'm going to have to draw proceedings to a close now because we do like to finish on time. Uh, so a big thank you to all our panellists who've given their time um, to be here today. Uh, hopefully uh, people who are on the call on the session have found it really useful I'm sure they have I know that I have I think the takeouts that I've had from this which is in terms of 
business without barriers and removing those barriers. Small changes make a huge difference. Uh, in the current climate, you really can't afford not to do it. And perhaps importantly, uh, it's something you can do. It's something you should do and help is at hand. It's not as scary as you might think. And you've seen from the speakers today uh, that some of that help is, is around the table here. So a big thank you to our speakers. A big, big thank you uh, for everybody who's logged on today. Hottest day of the year so far. So hopefully you get to spend a, a little bit of a relax in the sunshine after this event. Um, if you've enjoyed the uh, session, please do leave a Trustpilot review. We really, really appreciate it. And it helps to encourage more people to take advantage of these free webinars and sessions offered by the Federation of Small Businesses. So it's 12 o'clock. It's Friday. It's lunchtime time to sign off and thank you everybody for taking part and see you again next time. Goodbye.